Welcome back to the Last Days Book Club, where we are reading the short story Bibles for Breakfast by Bradley Booth, the author of The Miracle of the Seventh Day Ox. This story is set in the former Soviet Union, featuring a young couple, Alexander and Natasha, who were wondering about the meaning of life when an Adventist coal porter, Leonid Sierkowski, knocked on the door, offering to sell them a Bible and the great controversy. But not only did he offer to sell them the books, but in his introduction, he addressed the very questions they had just been asking themselves. The Holy Spirit was already at work and Leonid was invited to linger and teach them more about the subject matter of these books, which he readily did. They immediately decided to purchase the books, though their funds were low, and Leonid promised to return with their copies in a few days. We pick up the story now in Chapter 4. Alexander and Natasha had never heard such things before. What Leonid was telling them was truly amazing. It was as if their minds were sponges, soaking up all the good things that he was sharing with them about God's plan of salvation for the world. But more importantly, it was touching their hearts personally, making them see everything in their lives from a new perspective. The couple sat side by side on the couch, listening to this young man as he spoke from his heart. Leonid told them about the creation of the world and the fall of man, and about God's chosen people down through the ages. And all the things he talked about seemed to make sense, even if it was something they'd never heard before. Creation and evolution were classic examples. Neither Alexander nor Natasha were Christians, so of course they had been taught only the theories of evolution in the Russian schools. They had never heard an alternative explanation of how this world came to be. They didn't know that only a small fraction of people on earth actually believe in the silly notions of evolution that fish could change into amphibians, amphibians into lizards, and then eventually lizards into birds. But now, the idea of creation was like an open window to Alexander. It seemed to free him up to express all the things he had ever wanted to say about how foolish the theory of evolution sounded. I've always wondered if monkeys changed into men at one time in history. Is it possible for men to change back into monkeys? He exclaimed. They all had a good laugh over that one. And Natasha had to admit that sometimes Alexander acted more like a monkey than a man. Then Leonid told them of the story of Eden and how Satan had used a snake to deceive Adam and Eve into eating some fruit, how they fell for his deception, and how they hid themselves when God came looking for them in the evening. Alexander and Natasha sat in awe when they heard that a lamb had to be sacrificed to represent the Savior who would one day come to save the world from sin and tears came to Natasha's eyes when she heard that Earth's first couple had to leave their garden home. Their sin had cost the human race a life in paradise. Why would Adam and Eve take the fruit if God asked them not to? Natasha wanted to know. Didn't they have enough to eat? Alexander smiled at the innocence of her question, but then he grew sad as he listened to Leonid continue. 
Yes, they had enough. God had been so good to them, giving them everything they could possibly desire in their new garden home. But you see, Eve grew curious when she ventured away from Adam. And suddenly, she found herself at the tree God had told them not to even visit. She stopped to look and listen to a beautiful serpent talk. She should have been shocked at such a thing. But a talking snake was something she had never seen before. And instead of remembering that God loved her and had given her and Adam so many blessings, she trusted the words of the serpent instead of God. Leonid shook his head. I'm afraid we are very much like them today. When we are tempted to do wrong, we usually know what the right thing to do is, but we want to play with sin. Unfortunately, like Eve, we don't understand the power of Satan and how much he hates God. We don't understand that Satan's greatest delight is to make us do wrong, which of course will bring God great pain because he's our father and he loves us so much. Alexander and Natasha found it hard to believe that evil could become such a dominant force in the world so quickly after the fall of man. They were amazed that God could be so compassionate and patient with generation after generation who turned away from him to live lives of brutality and lust. As Leonid told them about Noah, it did not surprise them to think that God had to send a flood of waters to destroy a world that was out of control. Leonid told Natasha and Alexander stories about God's chosen people, stories about Moses, Gideon, and Samuel, and how God used these men to lead his people. He told them stories about leaders like Daniel and Esther, who were able to give God's people hope. Despite the fact that Adam and Eve sinned, God had a plan, Leonid told them. His plan was to save the world and bring people back to him. No sacrifice was too great to accomplish this goal. But how can God save people if they keep wanting to be bad, Alexander asked. I mean, people are basically bad. He pointed to a bookshelf on the wall of their tiny apartment. I have a few books of history there, and from what I've read, history tends to repeat itself. No matter how good a ruler is, or how many good things he has done for a country, when he dies, sooner or later, a new king or dictator will rise up who is evil and thinks only of himself. Leonid nodded in agreement. A very good point, Alexander. You have hit the nail on the head. People do tend to be bad, but it doesn't change the fact that God wants to save us. However, he won't force us to do anything we don't want to do. It's our choice. We have to want to be saved. It's strictly our choice. Leonid held up his Bible. People have always had choices. The people before the flood had a choice whether to go into the ark or not. It was their choice. The Israelites had a choice about whether they would believe God could take them through the Red Sea when they were trying to escape from the Egyptians. It was their choice. They had to step out in faith or be left behind. God's people had a choice when Samuel said that Israel didn't need a king. Samuel told them that God should be their king. But again, it was their choice. 
and they chose to get a king of their own anyway. Alexander and Natasha were torn between asking questions and just sitting and listening to what Leonid was telling them. As he turned the pages of his Bible to show them where all the stories were, they were overwhelmed that all this was in one book. There was so much to share. But Leonid knew that Alexander and Natasha had no knowledge of the Bible. How much could he share with them on this first night without overwhelming them? He didn't want to overdo it, but they were just drinking in everything. It didn't seem to really matter what story he was telling them. It was clear to Leonid that the Holy Spirit was doing his job in guiding the discussion. But when Leonid told them the story of how Jesus came as a baby to save the human race, Alexander and Natasha stopped asking questions. They were silent as they heard that Jesus lived the life of a poor man so that he could give hope to those who had nothing. They were filled with wonder that Jesus brought healing to demoniacs and the deaf and the dumb. The story about Jesus in the garden facing Satan's temptations alone was a sad one. And the crucifixion was almost too incredible to believe. They couldn't imagine such cruelty toward anyone, let alone the creator of the universe. Alexander and Natasha watched Leonid's face as he talked. They knew they had never seen anyone so godly and so full of peace as Leonid. They could tell he really believed in what he was saying and that he truly did love this God at the center of all his stories. The young couple was so interested in the things Leonid was sharing that they forgot all about the time. When they finally looked at their watches, they realized it was already past midnight. The end of chapter 4. Chapter 5. Oh, look at the time, Natasha exclaimed. We've kept you so late. We're sorry. We're so sorry. You must be tired, Leonid. Thank you. But you shouldn't worry, Leonid smiled again. I'm used to this. I sell books for a living. And when people want to hear about God's word, I forget about the time too. We must not keep you any longer. Do you live far from here? Not far. About 20 minutes by train. Alexander got to his feet. Can you come again soon? We want to hear more. He took Leonid's hand and shook it. If tonight was this much fun, I can only imagine what the next time will be like. Yes, and will you come for supper this time? Natasha's eyes shone as she looked at Leonid eagerly. If you eat with us the next time you visit, we can even talk about the books during supper. I'd like that. Leonid put the two books back in his bag. Thank you for a pleasant evening. I look forward to seeing you again soon. He set his book bag down on the floor. Before I go, I would like to pray to our Father in Heaven. The three of us have so much to talk about, and we need the Holy Spirit to help us and guide us when we visit like this. And so, Leonid prayed, and the young Russian couple marveled at the way he spoke to this spiritual being they couldn't see. Leonid talked to God as though God were right there with them in the room. It was a most moving experience that Alexander and Natasha had ever had. It was a short prayer, and when Leonid finished, he was smiling. Thank you for a wonderful evening. I look forward to coming again in a few days with your books, 
You can be sure of that. The dogs nuzzled up against Leonid as he put on his coat and prepared to leave. He gave Boris and Lexi one more pat on the head and then went out into the night. Alexander and Natasha were overjoyed at the good news as Leonid called the gospel. It was all so new to them. The kind of books Leonid was selling were rare in Russia at this time because the communist government forbade the making and selling of such books. If Leonid's books should be found by the authorities, they would be confiscated. And owning such books could jeopardize the status of a person's job too. People gained and lost jobs because of who they knew and how agreeable they were with local officials. If a person didn't cooperate with government leaders, it was very easy for them to be reassigned to a less prestigious job somewhere else. Unfortunately, it was that simple. Natasha's job was not that important, but it did allow her to stay close to home so that she could prepare Alexander's meals, watch the dogs, and keep their house in spotless condition just as she liked it. Alexander's job was a bit more important financially, and to lose it would be very hard for them. It paid a little better than jobs working as a store cashier or a street sweeper. He and Natasha needed the money, and they certainly didn't need the attention the KGB might bring if they discovered books in their house like the ones Leonid was selling. What would happen to them if they were caught with the books? If the books should be considered a serious enough political threat? Or if the local officials wanted to make an example of the offender, then the penalty could be much more severe. The owners of such books could be fined and sometimes even imprisoned for a while. Alexander and Natasha talked about the dangers associated with their newfound knowledge, and together they decided that they didn't care. These books promised to make a huge impact in their lives. Already, the books had brought them a renewed sense of hope and energy for life. They were worried, however, about the trouble this could make for Leonid if the government found out he was selling Bibles and other religious books in their apartment complex. What would happen to him if he were caught? After all, in most parts of the Soviet Union, it was against the law to have a job other than the one assigned by the local officials. Worse yet, since the government taught students and citizens that there was no God, selling books about him was illegal and considered a criminal offense. It was frightening thinking about such things, but it could happen. Unfortunately, they still didn't know God well enough to trust Him, and they didn't know how to pray, but they were learning. As it was, the most they could hope for was that everything would work out for the best so they could get their books. The angels must have smiled to see this couple so hungry for truth, and they marked the little Russian home for special attention and care. A new day was beginning for Natasha and Alexander, and the angels wanted to be there when the couple gave their hearts to Jesus. The days passed quickly, and with the tasks of life occupying their time, Alexander rode the train to and from the city bank, and Natasha did business from her small windowed office on the first floor of their building. Alexander stood in his usual place near the bank vault, and Natasha kept the halls of the apartment complex looking neat and clean. Before they knew it, Leonid was knocking on their door several evenings later. The Russian couple could not explain the giddy anticipation they had felt all week at having such a guest in their home. 
Even Boris and Lexi felt it. Was it the good news of salvation he was bringing them that made their hearts race? Was it the exciting stories from long ago that gave them glimpses of truth and forgiveness and power to live for Jesus? Of course, they also knew Leonid was bringing them the two coveted books they had brought, and that had much to do with the excitement in the air. Once again, Alexander and Natasha welcomed Leonid in and made him feel at home. And once again, they forgot about all their worries and listened excitedly as Leonid shared with them the keys to happiness and contentment in life. He told them amazing stories from the Bible, but he also shared miracle stories of modern day people he had met who had been searching for God. He told them of a little old babushka who had been asking God to send her someone who would help her learn about God. When I came to her door and knocked on it, the little woman opened the door excitedly. Come in, come in. Her eyes were almost dancing. I have been expecting you for several days. I asked the woman why. And she said she had been praying that God would help her. She did not know much about God, but she knew that he must exist because nothing else made sense. So she prayed. And then she had a dream. And a shining man in her dream told her that someone would come to her home with two books about God. These books would tell her about the soon coming of Jesus from heaven. The end of chapter 5. Chapter 6 Alexander stared at Leonid expectantly and the shining man in her dream was coming from God? And thinking he was, Leonid nodded reverently because in her dream the woman saw the two books with their titles in the shining man's hand. The very titles? Alexander's eyes widened. The very titles. And what were the names of the two books? Leonid pulled a copy of the Bible and the great controversy from his book bag. These two books. Natasha gasped. The very ones you sold us? A hush of holy silence settled upon the little room in their apartment, and she put her hands to her heart. These very ones. Leonid glanced at Natasha and Alexander, letting the impact of his words settle in. This is amazing. Natasha could hardly believe her ears. Truly, this is a miracle straight from heaven. God answered the babushka's prayer in a powerful way. And you are living proof of it, Leonid. We're so privileged to hear this story from a man of God who experienced such a thing. It was truly a miracle, Leonid agreed. And the woman was so astonished that she began to cry. Over and over again, she kept saying, Slava Boag. Slava Boak, praise God, praise God. Thank you for this story. Alexander took Leonid's hand. As you did for this woman, you have brought us hope and a new life to live. Praise God, Slava Boak, Leonid humbly replied. Slava Boak, Alexander echoed his thoughts. The three of them, studied the Bible some more, and then Leonid said he needed to go to visit his mother. Thank you again, Alexander, Natasha. God bless you both. Now remember, God promises in his Holy Bible that we are not to worry. He will care for us. Leonid held up the Bible he was carrying. This book says, Do not fear, 
for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my righteous hand. We can find these words in our new Bible. Alexander's eyes brightened again as he held up his own copy of the sacred book. You can. It is found in the section called Isaiah, chapter 41, I believe. He smiled and got down on his knees. And now, before I go, let us pray to God that he will keep you in the palm of his hand to protect you. Alexander and Natasha knelt on the big round carpet in the center of their living room. They bowed their heads as Leonid prayed to the God of the universe that they were learning to love. Our Father, thank you so much for guarding our lives every day with your love, Leonid prayed. We know you care for us because we are your children. Please be with Alexander and Natasha as they begin their journey to your kingdom. Let them always know it is your word that can give them the answers they need to live a happy life. Please watch and keep their steps day by day until we see each other again. And come soon to take us home, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have a special favor to ask of you, Leonid said as he got to his feet. I'm leaving on the train to Sokolovo tonight and will not be back for two days. But I have this box of books here with me that have been delivering to some of my customers. He picked up the box sitting on the floor by the kitchen table. Unfortunately, I've not been able to deliver them all because some of the people were not at home. And now, it is late. I don't have time to take the books back to my apartment before leaving for the train station. He glanced at his watch. I must go there immediately. Is it possible for me to leave the box of books here with you until I come back from my trip? I will pick them up when I return. Alexander slapped Leonid on the shoulder. Of course! We would be glad to help you out. Anything to help a man of God. Leonid breathed a sigh of relief. Thank you so much. You folks are such good friends. Now I don't have to hurry on my way to the station. Alexander reached for the box. Maybe we'll have some time to look over some of the books before you come back for them. He grinned in his boyish way. And Natasha laughed. I don't think so, she said as she took the box of books from him and carried it back to a room that was used for storage. We'll be too busy reading the ones we already bought. And she was right. Each morning, before Alexander left, they would try to squeeze in a few minutes of reading while they ate their breakfast of eggs, Russian black bread, and kasha, a kind of porridge made from buckwheat and served warm with sour cream. And then, as soon as Alexander arrived home in the evening, they would hurriedly eat supper and wash the dishes in order to spend as much time as possible with the books. Even so, they often read late into the night. This is all so exciting, Natasha admitted on the second night of reading the books together. Whatever will we do with our time when we've finished reading the books? That's easy, Alexander laughed. We'll just read them through again. And again and again, Natasha chimed in excitedly. A peace settled over them as they read together. The next morning, Alexander teased Natasha as he left for work. Now don't be reading snatches of the books while I'm gone today. I know, I know, Natasha retorted with a sweet smile. We read them together the first time through. She gave him a hug. That way, you can explain things to me from a historical point of view. 
I never was any good with history. The end of chapter 6. On Sunday evening, the weather was a bit warmer, and to Alexander and Natasha's surprise, Uncle Vitelli and Aunt Marina showed up. Everyone was excited to be together again after being cooped up inside during the long winter. And of course, Boris and Lexi were anxious to get in on all the hugs and kisses being spread around. It was a grand evening as the men discussed weather and politics and the women talked about all the latest gossip. Alexander, Natasha, I have an announcement to make, Uncle Vitelli said with a, the pomp of a king. I'm thinking of buying an old automobile. An automobile? Natasha's mouth dropped open in surprise. Can you afford it? Automobiles are awfully expensive. I don't think I know anyone who owns one. I've been saving my money for years, Uncle Vitelli bragged, and I'm going to get one. Marina does not like the idea so much, but she will when she gets to ride in it. This is news, Alexander was clearly excited. Where will you buy it? Does someone have one they will sell? It must clearly be broken if they want to sell it. All cars have problems, Uncle Vitelli said with a wave of his hand as if to dismiss the thought. It's a small one, and old, but I'm getting it for a very good price. A friend who works at the accounting office of my building said he must sell it. Alexander listened, his eyebrows up. He was waiting for the inevitable downside of such a deal. Few people in Russia could afford to own a car, so there had to be a catch. Uncle Vitelli hesitated and then added with a flourish. It will not run. It just sits in a storage room where we work. But the building manager said he must get it out of there. Uncle Vitelli gave a triumphant smile. I have seen it, and it looks nice. I took my nephew with me to inspect it, and he says it needs work, but he will help me fix it if I will let him use it sometimes. Well, that much is good, Alexander smiled. How much does the car cost? 600 rubles. 600 rubles? I wish I had that much money, Alexander confessed. I would not spend it on an automobile, though. No? And what would you spend it on? I don't know. Traveling, maybe? Good books. Books can take you anywhere. And they cost less than the actual trip, you know. Uncle Vitelli smiled. Ah, yes. I love to read. But riding in an automobile down the road on a nice spring day is much better than reading about someone doing it. You make your point well, Alexander laughed. By now, Natasha and Marina had gone back to subjects of more interest to women, like the price of beets in the market, and where they could get a pair of new hose, and where Aunt Victoria had been getting her hair dyed. But the dogs were getting excited again. Boris grabbed one of his toys in his mouth and begged for Uncle Vitelli to play catch with him. Then he jumped up on Aunt Marina's armchair and began barking so loudly that no one could hear themselves talk. Oh, Boris, get down, Alexander scolded him. Is that any way to treat our guests? Shame on you. Natasha, let's put the dogs into the back room. They'll be quiet there, and then we can have some peace and quiet. That's a good idea, Natasha turned to her aunt and uncle. We're so sorry. We should have done that a long time ago. Boris is just a puppy still, and he's always getting into everything. The rascal, he chews up everything he can find. When Lexi had her last litter of puppies, we gave them all away, but somehow we became attached to this one. She rubbed the fur on Boris's neck and scratched him under the chin, all the while giving him baby talk. Come on, you big puppy dog. You're such a big, noisy, clumsy dog. But we love you anyway. Yes, we do. She took him by the collar and led the two dogs to the back of the apartment. 
Now, come in here a while and be a good dog, Boris. Come on now, be a good dog, she said, pushing him into the storage room. Stay with your mother here where you belong. For the first time that evening, it was quiet. The two ladies then prepared a warm supper, and what a sumptuous meal it was. Bright red borscht made from beets and cabbage and carrots. Thick slices of Russian bread, slabs of goat cheese imported from the Baltic region, and of course, the usual tea offered at every Russian meal. For dessert, Natasha brought out one of her famous Prianieki cakes. Speaking of books, Alexander said, getting back to the discussion from before supper, we just bought two new ones the other day. New books? Uncle Vitelli raised his eyebrows. What kind? Books about history, religion, the future. You'd really like them, Uncle Vitelli, Natasha got in on the conversation, her eyes lighting up, especially the one that talks about religious history. That good, huh? Absolutely. We can't put it down. The book starts out with the history of the Jews in the Roman Empire during the first century AD. Then it goes on through the later history of the Roman Empire. Right now, we're reading about the Renaissance and Reformation in Europe during the 1500s. Hmm, what's the name of the book? It's called The Great Controversy. The end of chapter 7 of the story Bibles for Breakfast. <laughs>